But we are headed to Orlando last week and uh, or the week before, and we're in this fancy rental minivan that has about 14 different speakers in it. And we're listening to a Pandora station. We look at the watch, and it's about time for church to start. So we shut down the Pandora station, and we tap into the live stream feed. And you could not tell the difference in the quality of sound between the Pandora channel and our live stream. Now, if you don't understand what I, no, churches do not live stream their music because it's just whatever happens, like, just doesn't come across. But for Richard and all the guys and gals back there, you guys did a phenomenal job. It is amazing to listen to uh, on that live stream. And I came back sick, still got a little bit of it, and came back with the kidney stone acting up. As a matter of fact, I go into Baptist Hospital tomorrow morning, and they're going to go Star Wars on me. They're going to laser the stones. It's now stones, plural. So I got that sick. I got the stone thing going on, and all that's happening. And then we are gathered with pastoral staff and spouses Friday night for this wonderful dinner that we're just enjoying the wonderful food in each other's company. And I'm not feeling too well, so I leave early to get home and find out that we have a burst pipe and my home has flooded. Oh, well. And then you think, what else could go wrong? I just need one more thing. And then my phone goes, ding, and I've got a text message. And I'm not making this up. I took a screenshot, and this is the text message that was on my phone. Congrats to two lucky users of internet data. Today's winners of iPhone 11 are Nancy Pelosi and Rick White. I'm thinking, Obviously, this is a scam. <laughs> Until two FBI agents knock on my door with a subpoena, and I am appearing before a House subcommittee next week to find out if the Russians are colluding with my sermon preparation. <laughs> Let's just give thanks. I don't know, it's, we were coming up on the Thanksgiving day, one of the, the favorite holidays that we all have, family gathers a wonderful meal. Now, if I were to ask you a little bit about the history of Thanksgiving day, probably most of us in this room would be very familiar with the story of the pilgrims and the events surrounding it. But it actually comes as a day that we celebrate as a nation, Thanksgiving, really. It was in 1789 when President George Washington declared that there would be a day of Thanksgiving. And that really was not the day where the Thanksgiving holiday started because the following year, there were still Thanksgiving holidays, but every state celebrated on a different day. And it wasn't until 1863 that President Abraham Lincoln said, we will declare the fourth Thursday of every November to be Thanksgiving Day. So that is the day that we gather, and that's the day that we celebrate, and we remember the things that, that God has done for us. It is a day to give thanks. And as we look at all the things that God has done for us, and we look at our lives as Christian, one of the things that dawned on me is that this is a holiday we can have every day. Now, not every day you get off work, and not every day is this phenomenal meal, but for a believer in Jesus Christ, every day is Thanksgiving Day. Every day you have something to give thanks for, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, no matter what the environment, no matter what the condition, you can give thanks to God every day. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. If you have your Bibles there or if you have scrolled there, if not, this would be a good time to download the Christian Fellowship app. It has Bible translations there as well. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sleep, 
sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are some things that we can be thankful for every day. And for the next few moments, I want to draw your attention to three things that I personally thank God for every day. One, I am thankful every day that God stands for me. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question. And we obviously know the answer because it's no doubt as far the answer is. The, the, the issue revolves around any word, any preference that you could put in there. The answer is who? The question who? The answer is nobody can stand against us. The question is what? Nothing can stand against us. The question is when? Never can anything stand against us. The question of where? Nowhere can anything stand against us. And that's the promise we have from God. When you read the Bible carefully, you'll find that one of the greatest lessons ever taught in Scripture is that God plus you equals a majority. Joseph learned that when he was in prison. Job learned it when he was going through his trials. Jonah loved, learned it in the belly of the well. Joshua learned it at the battle of Jericho. Elijah learned it on Mount Carmel. Peter and Paul and Silas learned it in prison. When we go through the different things in life, the difficult things, we learn that God is there with us. He stands for us and we have that promise. And one of the greatest promises in the entire Bible is the one that every one of us should memorize. Have this on your refrigerator. Write it down on your heart with a pen of steel and indelible ink. Isaiah chapter 54. No weapon formed against you will prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is the vindication from me, declares the Lord. How can we be confident of that? How can we believe what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8? How can we believe that nothing can stand against us? What, 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 what biblical predicate do we have to build upon for which we can believe that? Go back to Romans chapter 8 verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That is an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God gave us his son, the greater, will he not also give us other things, the lesser? You know, there is nobody in the world I would give either of my sons up for. I don't care who you are. I don't care what's, what's going on. There's no way in the world I'm going to give up either one of my sons. But God gave up his son for you and I while we were still sinners. And as a result of that, we have this promise. If he's willing to give you his son, will he not also provide for you the other needs? When you're sick, when the stones are moving, when your house has been flooded, God will take care of all those needs. We have that promise. The Old Testament book of Genesis, the story is told of Abraham. And God calls Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham, without complaining, without whining, without griping, gathers up his son Isaac, and they go to sacrifice Isaac. And just at a crucial moment, God intervenes and says, Abraham, you've proven yourself faithful. I know you'll obey me. You don't have to sacrifice your son Isaac. But Abraham was willing to give his son. And if you're willing to give your son, what else? You'll give everything else. If Abraham was willing to give his son, do you think if God said, Abraham, I need you to tithe, what would be Abraham's response? You bet, I'll do it. If he said, Abraham, if you're willing to give your son, would you give of your time and your talent? You bet, I'll do that. If he said, Abraham, you're willing to give of your son, will you also give of your treasure? He said, I'll do that. And here's the point. If a man will offer you his son, there is certainly nothing else he would not do for you. Let's assume for just a second that you are my worst enemy and I give my son for you to pay the penalty for what you've gone through. Would I not also give you my son's clothes? Would I not also give you the car? Would I not also give you the guitar and the drum set? I'd give you everything else. I've given you the most wonderful thing I have, and that is my son. There was a Roman senator, a wealthy Roman senator, thousands, 2,000 years ago. And his son was rebellious and ran off and left him. 
and, and was just doing crazy things and got to the point where the dad disowned the son. But this Roman senator had a slave by the name of Marcellus. And Marcellus treated him so well that as they began to grow and develop a relationship, the Roman senator began to treat Marcellus as his own son. And they developed a father-son relationship to the extent that the Roman senator adopted Marcellus as his own son. And when the senator died, he had disenfranchised his son, his biological son, and did not write him into the will. So when the biological son shows up for the reading of the will, the executor says, he didn't leave you anything, nothing. He left it all to Marcellus. Marcellus gets it all. But your father said, you get to choose one thing of all of his estate. And the biological son thought for a second and said, then I choose Marcellus. If you get the son, you get it all. When you invited Christ into your heart and your life, when you got the Son of God to come into your heart and your life, all your other needs will be taken care of. Why? Because you have a God who stands for you. I'm thankful every day that God not only stands for me, he stands with me. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. The phrase bring a charge is represented in one word in the Greek language, and it basically means to indict, to formally accuse. It's a legal term. You would bring a charge against someone. Now, who would bring a charge against God's children? Who would bring a charge against you that says you're not good enough to go to heaven? Who would bring a charge against you that said you're not good enough for God's love? Who would bring a charge against you that would say you're not worthy of eternal life? The answer to that for us is obvious. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 12, it tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Day and night, he stands before God and just begins to accuse us and list all of our sins. And so here is Satan, this prosecutor in the courtroom of God. And every day he brings a trial before us. And the reality is, the truth is, every time he says they're guilty, look at this. He is exactly right. He's got us dead to rights. And in this courtroom procedure that we're looking at, the truth of the matter is that you, have, that, that, that you are convicted and even after you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you still do wrong. Don't raise your hand. But I'm going to ask you, in the past seven days, have you had a wrong thought go through your mind? In the past seven days, from last Sunday till this Sunday, have you talked about somebody to somebody else that you know you shouldn't have been talking about? I, I, no raised hands, elder. Have you, have you had the opportunity to do good to somebody and you didn't do it? Did you have the opportunity to invite somebody to church and you didn't? So the thing is, all of us stand convicted in God's courtroom when the accuser of us stands before God and says, they are not worthy of it. But there's something that I had just, that just blows my mind that for the past 2,000 years, how is Satan still doing that? Hasn't he called on? Because for you and I as a believer in Christ, I don't know of any other way to say it, but the, the, the case is fixed. It's rigged. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, the word condemned in verse 34 is also a need, another legal term, but it's not about indictment, it's about the verdict. And the judgment has been given. And can you imagine in God's courtroom, the devil comes in as a prosecuting attorney, he has his briefcase, and it's filled to capacity with all the things that we have done wrong, and you look at that and you realize, I need a pretty good lawyer right about now. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, but if you do sin, there is someone to plead you before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who pleases God completely. He's our defense attorney. Now you might be thinking right now, well, that's not too bad. I think Jesus can handle that. He's a pretty good attorney, but that's just half the story. John chapter five, verse 22 says this. Moreover, the did you get the picture of that? I, I gotta fit, there are times I almost feel sorry for the devil. 
every time he comes in, he's got evidence lined up. He's got signed statements. He's got, he's got evidence from A to Z. He, he's, he's got tape recordings. He's got photographs. He can call witness after witness and say they're not worthy. And that's the fact. And he gets up to give this impassioned closing argument. That's this airtight case that we're not worthy. Then our defense attorney, who has said nothing for the entire trial, just stands up and shows the nail print in one hand and the gavel comes down and says, not guilty, case dismissed. Do you want to know why, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you never have to fear the persecution of the enemy? It's because over 2,000 years ago, your case was settled out of court. You never have to go inside again. Jesus died for your sin, paid for your sin, and his resurrection is the proof that God accepted that payment for your sin. So God stands for me, God stands with me. And thirdly, I thank God every day that he stands by me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. If you are familiar with Romans chapter 8, you remember how Romans chapter 8 starts. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. It starts with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. What an amazing logical sequence that is. And I've never seen this before because I struggled in math the entire time that I was in school. Math was not my subject. But there is a mathematical principle that falls in place here that we have to understand. God came to us as sinners and he added grace to our lives. He subtracted the sin from our lives. Then he multiplied the forgiveness in our lives so that there would be no division between him and us in our life. And you have heard this said before, but it's worth repeating almost every Sunday. There is nothing you can do that is so bad that will stop God from loving you. And there is nothing so good you can do that will cause him to love you more than what he does right now. You are accepted in the eyes of God. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The Greek word that is used for more than conqueror there, it's a compound word. The first part of the word is the Greek word Nike. You're familiar with that. That means victor. The other part is it means hyper or hoopo. It's, it's above and beyond. So this, this more than conqueror is someone who understands this. The, well, the difference between a conqueror and more than a conqueror is a conqueror who's someone who fights and wins the battle. The more than a conqueror is someone who knows the battle is won before they even fight it. You are more than a conqueror. When you begin to understand and realize and accept your identity in Christ and what he has done for you, you understand every day is a day you can say, thank God. No matter what's, what, what, what's your situation, no matter what you're going through, you can get up, look in the mirror and say, God has blessed me beyond all goodness. He is worthy of my praise. Today is a Thanksgiving day. Tomorrow is going to be a Thanksgiving day. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But on your worst day, it is still Thanksgiving Day because you know and love and serve a God who stands for you, with you, and by you no matter what.